Good morning, soldiers. Welcome to the war. At ease. Last week, we learned that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's spiritual. So today, let's look at one of our most valuable spiritual weapons, the sword of the spirit, which is, that's right, the word of God. Say you're battling temptation designed to derail you from your divine purpose. Draw your sword, Matthew 4. Jesus used scripture to counter Satan's temptations in the wilderness. Whether it's a lure of immediate gratification or a shortcut that veers off God's plan, the word of God is our spiritual weapon for defense and attack. Say you're battling a spiritual attack, coming through a hateful coworker, or a deceitful close friend. Draw your sword, Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Remember, vengeance is God's business, not ours. I know you want to help God out, but really, let Jesus take the wheel. God's got it. Your battle might be internal. You may be wrestling with issues of self-esteem and self-worth. Draw your sword, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's handiwork translates from the Greek word poema, from which we get our English word poem. So, God's handiwork means that each of us is a crafted work of art made by God. You are made with a purpose, knit together in your mother's womb, as Psalm 139 tells us, crafted by the ultimate craftsman. I pray you see how effective your sword can be in battle. Soldiers, the battlefield is not optional. So if we stay ready, we don't have to, <laughs> that's right, get ready, you got it. Equip yourself daily with the sword of the spirit. Keep it sharpened, accessible, and ready for use. Remember, draw your sword. It's the weapon you need to secure victory in spiritual warfare. See you on the battlefield. Now, we're, we're in the middle of a series, so be careful. Um, we're dealing with addressing spiritual warfare. And, and I, don't know, I don't know about y'all, after I preached every day, Every single day, I've been under attack. But I know we win. And, and I, I know that the enemy does not want us to know what God's word says about his attacks. And so last week we learned, uh, we're in a series called This Means War. Last, last week it was suit up. And we learned the importance of putting on the full armor of God. And the word of God says... We put on the full armor of God, watch this, so we could withstand the schemes, the plans, the plots, the deception, the tricks of the enemy. Then we learn, listen, we don't war against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, blood lied on you. Flesh and blood cussed you out. We don't war against flesh and blood. We realize that it's the enemy using other people against us, suit up against every scheme, every trick of the enemy. Today, this means war, strongholds. This means war, strongholds. Now, if you have your Bible, if you want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you read the, the, uh, Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, if you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you will notice Paul has a very harsh tone. In fact, the way that Paul is addressing the believers at Corinth is intense. And if, you, if, you, if you, some of your Bibles may even have it, Paul switches and he begins to address that his leadership, his ministry, or his apostleship has now been put into question. In fact, you would, he, he realized that he was being opposed. Listen. Not by people on the outside. Start the car. 
but by people on the inside. He, he realized that leaders had, had risen up and come up, and they were putting into question uh, Paul's leadership, Paul's ministry, Paul's authority, and his apostleship. And what they were doing is they were using arguments, lies, and tricks to drive them away from the apostle Paul. So they had to put his, they had to put his authority or apostleship into question so that they can put the church into question, ultimately to put the gospel into question to get them away from the church and the gospel so they can live in error. Are you with me? And so Paul, when Paul realizes this, he's defending his apostleship. And in fact, if you read the beginning of, 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 of chapter 10, verse 1 through 2, he says, um, um, I'm timid. He says, I pray that I don't have to be as bold in person as I am in this letter. But I've been gentle. I've been gracious. And, and, and so it seems as though you took my kindness for But my kindness wasn't weakness. My kindness was meekness. And he begins to use words in the original language that correlate with the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm, 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 I'm coming, bringing the same love, the same grace, the same mercy that Jesus did. But now it seems as though some leaders amongst us have now risen up and put my authority, my apostleship, my, my leadership in the question. And Paul says the way that they pay pay attention, the way that they have done this is they have created arguments or thoughts that go contrary to what God has done and what God has said. And Paul says anytime someone does something like this, we must declare it spiritual warfare. This means war. And so Paul then begins to reveal to us that there are certain strongholds that the enemy wants to build amongst us believers. So the first thing that we learn from Paul is, in spiritual warfare, we must destroy strongholds. Uh Are you with me? In spiritual warfare, we as believers must destroy strongholds. You don't believe me? Go to verse 4. Verse 4 says this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Watch verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You still with me? And we take captive every thought. Not some of the thoughts. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now, here, Paul is, he's using warfare language, right? Paul, Paul uses language describing a battlefield, strongholds, and weapons. You with me? How, this, this is slightly different. Now, now Paul is using battlefield, uh, uh, weapons, and stronghold language that symbolizes and articulates or, or, or metaphors for war. You with me? Now, what's interesting about this is Paul's using this language And as he's using this language, he is not speaking of a physical battleground. You with me? The battleground he's talking about that the devil has has raised war against. It is not a physical material battleground that we must march towards. No, he reveals to us that there is a particular battlefield in which the enemy creates strongholds that are arguments and thoughts. So this this particular battleground is not physical, it is mental. Are you with me? Because they're arguments and they are thoughts, cognitive, that buff themselves up, puff themselves up, and rise up against God, knowledge of God, and against obedience to Jesus Christ. You still with me? So Paul says to us that any time a stronghold has been built in a believer's mind, a believer must demolish them. Now, 
Paul is using the, the language stronghold over and over again. He uses the word demolish over and over again. So we need to know what a stronghold is. Are you with me? Now, if the word of God says that there are strongholds built and it is our job as believers to demolish or destroy the stronghold, I need to know what a stronghold is. Now, I want to reveal two strongholds to you based on, on 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, first, first, first I want to describe to you a physical stronghold. Then I'll explain to you a spiritual stronghold. You with me? All right. A physical stronghold, it is a military fortification. You with me? All right. The doctor's in the house. We're going to teach today. We done preached already. Stronghold, listen, it's, it's a military fortification. You with me? Now, a fortification is a military construction designed for defense of territories and warfare. Watch this. And used to establish rule in peace. Now, there are regions in which peace is made. All right? Now, what's interesting about a stronghold, historically, normally, a stronghold is a building or other structure that is a safe place. All right? It, it is a place that is safe from attack. So if you, if, if you were in war, you got to a stronghold, it would be a place of refuge. It would be a place of peace, a place that there wouldn't be attack. In fact, um, David can give us more insight in Psalm 9 and 9. This is what he says. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in the times of trouble. Are you with me? Now, uh, 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 David reveals to us that, in fact, throughout his life, if you watch David's life, as he moved forward to be king to do the things that God called him to be, David actually hid in strongholds. In fact, when armies and enemies were attacking him, David actually hid in strongholds. And David, the same David who hides or who hid in a stronghold, reveals to you and I that God is actually a stronghold. He says, the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my defense. The Lord is my strong place. In other words, if I'm being attacked by the enemy and I can get to the place where God is, the enemy cannot attack me. In fact, he says, if it, it does not matter if the enemy is attacking me if I'm in a refuge or region or place that God is. Now, let me see if I can try it this way. It, it does not matter if the enemy is after me. It doesn't matter if the enemy is attacking me if God's hand is on me. Because God's hand is a refuge, it's a stronghold. And I don't know anybody who can take me out of God's mighty right hand. So he reveals to us, God is a place, he's a stronghold. I don't know who's in here today. I don't know who's watching online right now. But no matter what wave comes, no matter what storms come, I got a testimony <laughs> that when the water rose and when the winds blew, when I found myself in the arms of God, it did not matter what storm came. It didn't matter what adversity came. It didn't matter what army came. It didn't matter what enemy came. As long as I was in the safety of God, my enemies could come, but they couldn't attack me because I was in the mighty, strong hand of God. A fortress, a stronghold is a fortress physically that you cannot attack. Here's my problem. Paul says, demolish the stronghold. But a stronghold normally is a place that was not being attacked or subject to attack. Now, if Paul is saying that we have strongholds, what type of stronghold is he referring to? I'm glad you asked. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 reveals to us something different that's going on spiritually. Are you with me? Now, a stronghold, this, this type of stronghold he's referring to is a stronghold that has been built when we accept and believe arguments and thoughts that go against knowledge of God. Say it one more time. Strongholds are built in our mind. When you and I accept and believe arguments and knowledge that go against God. Try one more time over here. Anytime you and I believe the lie, 
The enemy is building a stronghold in our minds. What the enemy does, very crafty, is he, he creates arguments and thoughts that go against knowledge of God and goes against who we are and who we are in Jesus Christ to get us to go away from God. Now, if I can change the way you think, I can change the way that you act. The, the, the enemy knows this. If I can change your mindset, I can change your behavior. And so what the enemy does is he comes up against everything that God says we are and everything God says he is to get us to walk contrary to what the word of God says. Now, you don't believe me? Let's go to the garden. Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve, watch this. This is very, this is very crafty. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 says this. But you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Watch this. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Another translation says, when you eat from it, you will surely die. I'm going to read it one more time. Genesis 2, 17 says this. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you do eat from it, you will surely die. You will certainly die. That's what God says. Are you with me? Now let's watch what the, what the devil says. Go to chapter 3. Just go ahead and scroll or turn the page in your Bible. Watch Genesis 3 and 4. It says this. You will not surely die. <laughs> See how slick the enemy is? <laughs> you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Here, here's the argument. Go to verse 5. For God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Are you with me? Now, here's the stronghold that was built in their mind. Now, verse 6 reveals to us that after she believed the devil's lie, after she believed an argument that went against what God said, after she ex ex accepted and did not take that thought captive. The words of God says that she now saw the tree in a different light. How did she see it? It was desirable. And it was pleasing to her eyes. And the word of God says, and then she ate from it and gave some of it to her husband. What am I saying? That the enemy could not get her to move outside of the will of God until he first formed an argument to get her to question what God said. He only got her to rebel when he got her to believe a lie. God said, if you eat from this tree, you will certainly die. The first words out of the enemy is, you will not surely die. You, you won't certainly die. You, you, you won't surely die. Because the enemy builds arguments, teases us, entices us, lies to us as if God is withholding something from us. And he uses that very thing to destroy us. And the word of God says uh, in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that when arguments that go against God or thoughts that go against God come, we must demolish them. Are you with me? He says we must demolish them and take every thought captive. Right? Why? Here it is. If you read chapter, chapter 10, the word of God says arguments set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Sometimes our thoughts if we don't take them captive, cause us to walk in disobedience to God. Right? And that, that's, this, is when I, this is why I learned this. In spiritual warfare, we must destroy every argument that goes against God. One more time. In spiritual warfare, we must destroy not some of the arguments, every argument that goes against God. Now, if you read, go, go to verse 5. Verse 5 says this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Did you see that? We, we, one more time, one more time, one more time. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Are you still with me? And we take captive every thought. Now, here, Paul says, since the enemy is building strongholds in our mind, we must demolish 
every lie that we've accepted. Say it one more time. Every lie that we have accepted that goes against God must be demolished. Are you with me? It, don't, don't, don't toy around with it. Don't, don't put it in the closet and close the door. Right? Paul says every argument that goes against who God is or who God says you are, you have to demolish it. Let me see if I can help you. Now, demolish. Catherine it says this, to destroy completely, all right, to destroy completely by tearing down or dismantling. Are you with me? To destroy, to tear down, destruction. That's what demolish means. Now, demolish means that if, if, the, if the enemy has placed this lie in my mind about me or about God, it is my job as a believer to destroy it completely, yes. right? To tear it down, to dismantle it, to, to utter destruction on the lie. Yes. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. God told us to do a demolition, and we've done a renovation. <laughs> God said, do a demolition, and we've done a renovation. Let me see if I can help you. Now, now... <laughs> Anybody ever renovated their home? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, renovation. Praise the Lord. Now, now a renovation, right, is updating an existing structure. I'm going somewhere. A renovation is updating an existing structure, watch this, with cosmetic changes. I go, I go into this particular room. And I say to myself, what can I add to this room to dress it up? What can I add to this room to make it more, more appealing or more, or more pleasing to the eye? Here, here, here's, now, the flip side. Now, a remodel is this. A remodel involves changing the structure. How do you change the structure? I changed the, you preaching right here. Good Lord, have mercy. She said, you tear it down. Right? Now, remodeling involves changing the structure through a demolition or construction. Now, watch this now. God said, dismantle, destroy, demolish the arguments. Some of us, now I got to look up. We've done a renovation. You haven't destroyed the lies of the enemy over your life. You've just dressed up the lie. Say it one more time. The enemy will make us keep the lie there and add some stuff around it. When God says, as believers, we must destroy every argument that the enemy places in our mind that goes against who God is and who God says that we are. Now, wh wh why am I worried about how I look if the Lord says I'm beautifully and wonderfully made? Why, do I always, why am I always afraid? When the word of God says, you, you, we shouldn't have a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Why, why am I always worried when the word of God, Jesus, Jesus himself says, be anxious for nothing? But, but there, there is something that the enemy does in our mind that makes us believe a lie that goes contrary to the character and the nature of God. And then we end up believing the lie and we live, listen, a limited life. Because I can't go as far as I want to go if I'm always afraid. I cannot go as far as I want to go if I'm always in fear. I cannot go as far as I want to go if every time I think about where God is trying to take me, I'm, I'm consumed with worry and fear. No, I have to shake off worry. I have to shake off fear and remind myself what God's word says about who I am and where I'm going. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Because the enemy doesn't want you to get where he's taking you. Because he not only knows you will be blessed when you get there, but God has ordained people down the road that when you get there, God's going to use you to bless their life. And so their future depends on you shaking off fear, shaking off anxiety, and moving into everything that God has for you. I need at least four people to help me declare, I'm shaking off fear. I'm shaking off anxiety. I'm shaking off worry. I will only declare who God says I am and where God says I'm going. And the last time that I checked, he still had all power in his hand. Listen to me. The reason why some of us have not even done what God told us to do. 
it's because we're still living in fear. The enemy, when he sees, I don't know who I'm talking to today. When the, 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 when the, the enemy knows what God has called you to do. And he knows that hell is in trouble when you do it. Listen to me. He knows how your light will shine and how he will use you to transform other people's lives when you say yes. And what he's done to you is he's allowed you to believe the lie that you're not usable, you've made too many mistakes. Ah, Lord, me, yes, you. First of all, everybody in the Bible besides Jesus was, was crazy. <laughs> uh, Moses was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Do I got to keep going or you get the picture? Uh, David was an adulteress, a murderer, a liar, and everything. So if God can use them, I have to believe that God has the ability to use me. But, but what I have to declare is, Lord, that's who I used to be. I forget the things which are behind me, and I press forward to what lies ahead. It's, who am I talking to this morning? God has not forgotten you. God has not left you. But we have to stop believing the lie that has us stuck. But that, that's why he says, listen, I, in spiritual warfare, I must demolish every argument. He doesn't stop there. He says, demolish every argument. Then he switches and says, and every thought. Every thought. He says, I need to take every thought captive in obedience to Jesus. Are you with me? So spiritual warfare, we must destroy any thought, any thought that goes against God. Are you with me? Now go, to, go, to, go back to verse 5. Verse 5 says this. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ, right? Paul, he, listen, he reminds us that anything that the enemy has told us that goes contrary to the obedience of Jesus Christ, we have to take it captive. Are you with me? We must take it captive. Now, now take captive is a war term. Now, in war, it means to gain complete control over. In fact, it means... Once, you, once you've taken it captive, it is, it is the job of the captor to lead it away. Think about your mind. Now, once you know that the lie is here in your mind, it is, it is our job to take that thought captive and lead it away out of our mind, watch this, and make it a prisoner. Now, in those days, they would, they would take the person captive, they would lead them away, and they would put them in prison, right? Now, think about the lie. Think, think about the thought that the enemy's placed in your mind. The word of God says, I must take it captive. I must lead it away. And I must make it a prisoner that is obedient and subject to Jesus Christ. Yeah. We, we, now, now, the mistake we've made sometimes is we have allowed the lie to stay there. We've acknowledged it, but we haven't dealt with it. We, we know that there is an argument or a thought that, that, that puffs itself up against God, but we're not doing anything about it. Paul says, you, if you let it stay there, it will grow and take over. It is our job as a believer to take it captive, lead it away, and make it a prisoner to Jesus Christ. It, it, it must be subject to what God's word says about who we are and who he is. And I've been praying all week that every single lie that the enemy has placed over you. Every lie he has placed in your mind, every argument, every thought that goes against who I know you are in Jesus Christ and who the word of God says you are, I bind it now in the name of Jesus. I've been praying that every thought be called captive in obedience to Jesus Christ because I don't want to leave here today without you knowing who you are and me knowing who we are. Are you, are you with me? Now, 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 I know this for sure that I am a child of God. You hear me? I am a child of God. I am redeemed from the hand of the enemy. This is what the word of God says. I know that I am forgiven. I know that I am saved by grace through faith. I know that I am justified. I know that I am sanctified. I know that I am a new creature. I know that I am partaker of his divine nature. I know that I am redeemed by the curse of the law. I know that I am I'm delivered from the powers of darkness. 
I know that I am led by the Spirit of God. I know that I am a son of God. I know that I am kept in safety. I know that I'm getting all of my needs met by Jesus. I know that I am casting all of my cares on Jesus. I know that I am strong in the Lord and power in his mighty hand. I know that I am doing all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know that I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. I know that I'm heir to the blessings of Abraham. I know that I am observing and doing the Lord's commandments and the Lord's will. I know that I am blessed when I'm coming in and I'm blessed when I'm coming out. I know that I'm an heir of eternal life. I know that I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. I know that my body is healed by his stripes. I am exercising my authority over the enemy. I know that I am only above and not beneath. I know that I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I know that I am establishing God's word here on earth. I know that I am overcoming by the blood of the lamb. Somebody help me preach. And the word of my testimony. I know that I am overcoming the devil. I know that I am not moved by what I see. I do know that I am walking by faith and not by sight. I know that I'm casting down every vain imagination. I know that I am bringing every thought captive to be obedient to Jesus Christ. I know that I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I know that I am a laborer together with God. I know that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I do know that I am an imitator of Jesus Christ. I am the light of the world, and I am blessing the Lord at all times, and his praises will continually come out of my mouth. Do I have any praises in the house today? Because the devil tried to lie about who I am, but I know whose I am, and I won't stop praising him because I'm bringing every thought captive to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Devil, you tried me on Monday. You tried me on Tuesday. You tried me on Wednesday. You tried me on Thursday. You shown up tried me on Friday, and you tried me yesterday. But I came early on Sunday morning to give God some praise because it doesn't matter what weapon was formed against me. I stand here this morning declaring it will not prosper. I cast down every lie in the mind of my brothers and sisters because I don't just know who I am. I know whose I am and he is the great I am. I am that I am because I will not be will be and I will be anything you need me to be. Somebody said he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Somebody said he's a lily in the valley. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because God is with me. Do I have any praises in this house this morning? Because I know who I am and I came to rage war against the enemy and I came to declare, you cannot have my mind. You cannot have my peace. You cannot have my joy. You cannot have my family. You cannot have my friends. You cannot have my faith. You cannot have my hope. You cannot have my dreams. You cannot have my visions. I came to declare war against the enemy because I will walk by faith and not by sight. And I've seen you in the future and you look a whole lot better than you do right now. Does anybody have any faith? Faith to praise him on Monday. Faith to praise him on Tuesday. Faith to praise him on Wednesday. Praise to praise him on Thursday. I will keep on praising God until I get my breakthrough. Now a breakthrough is when what God declared in heaven breaks through earth's sphere, which means if I want my breakthrough, as long as I keep moving, the blessing that God has already ordained is on its way. So I must keep on moving. 
I watched Magic Johnson play basketball. And one of the greatest moves that Magic Johnson did was an alley-oop. Magic Johnson would not throw the ball where the player was. He would throw the ball where the player was going. And I have a sneaky suspicion and a holy hunch that if you keep on moving, God's gonna throw you an alley-oop. And as long as you get there, when you catch the blessing, give God some glory, but you gotta keep moving. Moving through pain and moving through sorrow and moving through tears and moving through hardship and moving through liars and moving through opposition. Because when I get to the blessing that God has for me, I'm gonna keep on giving him praise. I heard somebody say, Pastor JP, that sounds like an Aliyu blessing. Well, I came to declare there's a blessing that's on the way. Will you keep moving? Will you keep trusting? If you believe in God's ability, help me give God some praise. The devil tried, but he lost.